I just want to take a moment before we begin uh, today and say thank you to everybody who has sent me emails. A lot of you have been following me on Facebook and saying how much you're enjoying the shows and listening to them and downloading them and taking them with you. And I wanted to just say thank you for taking the time to listen and to be here with me and my guests. It means so much to me. Today joining uh, me for the next hour is Stephanie Alston Nero. She is a traveling artist, healer, educator, and chanter of sacred songs. She uses her art to heal, and today we're going to be talking about what that means. The Hopi Indian word for heal means return to beauty. Her mission is to restore beauty through art and shamanic healing practices. She has studied shamanism with, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, Maladoma Petrus Somme, learning and participating in healing rituals and ceremonial practices of the Dagara people of Burkina Faso. And she'll be telling us and sharing our, her story with that and, and explaining that a little bit more today. She has also taken part in Maladoma's ancestralization ritual, a cosmic event that brings peace to the living and the ancestors. And she'll be sharing her experiences with that as well. She's also a student of Sandra Ingerman, author of Soul Retrieval, Healing the fragmented self and we're going to talk about that because I believe right now what a lot of people are experiencing is a need to find a healing practice or, or modality or you know some kind of therapeutic means to understand the energies that are coursing through us today there are so many people falling into fear and as, as my listeners know as all of you know that is one of the things that I strive very hard to uh, get that out, that concept out, that either you're in fear or you're in beauty. And one of the reasons Stephanie's work has really popped and caught my attention is because she dedicates so much of her time to really getting that idea across. Um, she's also owner and founder of Stone Feather Retreat, a place that's very dear to my heart. I've been lucky enough to hold a couple of my events at Stone Feather, and uh, and she's caretaker of that land, and she's an extraordinarily warm, wonderful, beautiful person. Thank you, Stephanie, for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you, Hillary. It's a pleasure to be sharing this time and space with you. Well, I'm so excited that you're here, and I have to say from sister to sister that your work really touches me, and I know that anybody who's experiencing your space and your energy, and when you read your poetry, which you'll be doing, I hope, later on at the, towards yeah. the end of our show, <laughs> sure, sure. Um, really has an opportunity to connect uh, in ways that, you know, a lot of people don't do now. So, so let's kind of start there before we get into talking about, you know, some of your, your really fascinating stories and, and things that you've participated in. What, what is one of the main reasons why you take this work out into the world? What do you find most people feel they need right now? They need hope. They need encouragement. They need to know that although the earth is going through major changes, although the economy is going through major changes, although life as they know it is going through major changes, that they think that we can survive. So I think more than anything, it's the fear, what you were talking about earlier. It's, um, it's that fear that, um, uh, that the mass media seems to be um, really projecting uh, so much of. Uh, we really have to protect ourselves from this fear that's going around and really uh, learn how to connect with our source of healing and light and what what it is uh, within ourselves, that power within ourselves that's going to, that has the cap capacity to return us to a state of beauty, which is healing. Mm. And when you say beauty, I, I wonder if people think that you mean, because a lot of times they don't understand what that even means, because the concept of beauty has been so distorted over time to mean being a beautiful person, an attractive person, you know, that kind of level of beauty. Now, when you say return to beauty, describe what you mean for the listeners. 
I say it in an ancient, um, a kind of indigenous um, uh, way. Um, to me, uh, well, as you said in my bio, I, I love the um, uh, understanding that the Hopi Indians had that healing is a return to beauty, that we, we start out in a state of perfection and a state of light and radiance, and as we go through life, um, we kind of slip out of that state of radiance and sacredness and um, um, our connection with the creator. So uh, a return to beauty, when I say return to beauty, I mean a return to that which is sacred within us and within the universe. I love it. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, really, because I, I, I say that a lot in my own my own stuff, and uh, that really gets people. They they understand the concept of seeing something as beautiful, but they really don't understand how deeply that heals. And I think that that I love how you work that into your work, and how you really emphasize that that's the the mission basically is to return to beauty, return to self, return yourself to spirit, and and seeing things is beautiful um, now there's 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 a lot of fear in the world like we were talking about earlier and a lot of people have a hard time finding beauty finding that balance because they see things as happening outside of themselves and everything is happening to them and and because of something else and there's a lot of blame and they don't take responsibility for their own healing processes what are what are your thoughts on on when somebody comes to you to work in a session type like, you know, setting with you and they say, well, this is happening to me and that's happening to me and, you know, something's coming at me and I don't understand it. What would you say to that person? I would say uh, I would have them to imagine um, what it would feel like and taste like and and sound like um, for them to be, um, you know, living um, in a state of harmony and peace, that which they say they want. Uh, because I think that if you can't imagine a positive future, you can never have one. So that's the, that's the, that's the starting place to enter the sacred space of imagination. Because um, that quote, and I always get it wrong, but um, there's a quote from the Bible <laughs> that says, uh, "If you can't, um, um, uh, without a without a without a vision, the people perish." Does that sound yeah. familiar? <laughs> yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah. Well, that's so, an interesting uh, concept because people really have taken a lot of time. This has been really big over the last few years: is our thoughts create our reality. And yeah. what we think happens and, you know, the law of attraction and we attract to us what we think and all of this stuff. And then I, 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 you know, I don't know about you, but I find myself sometimes, you know, when I realize things are happening or I'm perceiving them as happening outside of me, I, it's a moment for me to say, wait a minute, let me, let me step back here and take a look at what my thoughts are and what I'm thinking and what I'm helping to co-produce, you yeah. know, because we are co-producers and co-creators. And I know that's a very cliche saying, and you hear that all over the place. However, it's very true, yeah. um, you know, and uh, so shamanic healing. Now, I, I'm, I'm a shamanic practitioner myself, too. I've been trained. Um, I worked with Lynn Andrews for a long time, and I know that this is part of your background. Now, I want to I want to talk about this topic because when people see the word shamanic, it's almost like they see the word psychic and they get the same kind of perceived ideas about um, what that person should be like, what they should look like, what they should what should feel like when they're in their presence. Shamanic healing, I believe, has a wonderful way of shape shifting energy and it's open to anybody, any color, any race, any background. Right across the board. And I think it's very important that we bring a shamanic healing back to the awareness of the mainstream people so that they understand what that really means. Now, when you work as a shamanic practitioner, shamanic healer, what do you, what does that mean? Well, you know, often uh, people, um, more, uh, you know, nine times out of ten, in my experience, uh, people have the people I encounter have heard of shamanism, have heard of it, but uh, don't really know that much about it. And um, as many people um, 
have done reading about shamanism, and they know that, you know, in ancient times and in, in, in indigenous shamanic cultures, um, that there was um, some kind of a painful initiation in order to be a shaman, some near-death experience, some revelatory, um, you know, experience with the divine that would have had to happen in order to become a shaman, and then they look at they look at me and they say, well, you know, I, you know you're here you are teaching in this, you know, lovely environment and, you know, you, your clothes look good and you look, you know, well, <laughs> right. who, who do you think you are and what are you teaching? Uh, this yeah. is not the indigenous shamanic way. Um, did you have a near-death experience? Have you, um, you know, lost your mind for five years and and, and then had um, visions? Um, and I say, I, you know, I, what I answer to that, what I say to that is that, most of us in this culture, at least in traditional shamanic cultures, when a tragedy would happen, a trauma would happen, they knew that within three days uh, they would send the medicine person in and they would do perhaps a soul retrieval or any other kind of um, uh, ritual that would help restore balance to the individual in the village. But here in this culture, we have multiple traumas built up on top of each other. Some of us are, were born into families where there's only been chaos and and hostility and uh, uh, raging alcoholism and all kinds of um, emotional kinds of abusive situations and and I'm kind of blowing it up more you know more than uh, you know you know I'm kind of exaggerating that but in this culture we have a lot of things that have, have set us have 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 situated us in um, great emotional pain so I say is that not enough. Is that not enough pain to qualify to be a shaman? Mm. You know, some of us are experiencing depression and chronic fatigue syndromes and all these sustained levels of pain. Is that not enough? It almost makes you feel like, yes. (laughs) 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 I mean, when I'm sitting here thinking... Well, yeah, and I and I hope and I and I'm sure everybody listening is too because it's so true. I mean, we are growing up in in almost you know a disconnected setting to the point where you know we have problems in our relationships, we're unhappy with work, you know, all of these things that people come looking for healing things in the first place that create this kind of you know soup mix of of need of, of healing and transmutation and, and all of this fabulous, all the right ingredients seem to be there. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that I, I talk about too, and, and I think you hit this on the head too, is being a 21st century shaman and coming from a culture that we are not necessarily indigenous, but we have these genetic memories within us that we can access and we go through the healing process and we come out on the other side and we want to give back and we want to be midwives for healing and helping people find uh, a, a connection to the same peace and yeah. beauty that we have found. And I think that there's nothing more important than a shamanic process. Now, so, so when people come and they say, well, you know, where are all the feathers and all of this and that? And, and, you know, and they do. They really do say, well, you're, you know, for me, you know, I, I, I'm a white woman with blonde hair. How, how dare I? You know, <laughs> even consider using the word shamanic in my stuff. And that's always really bothered me because most of those people have never don't know my personal story don't know what i've been through the things that have you know kind of pushed me through that process you know and yes i have studied with people so it's really interesting how people's perception of shamanic healing even is in the general you know so i wanted to address that because we're going to go into some in-depth talking about shamanic practices that you've been a part of and some of the ceremonies that you've done but before we do that i'd like to also mention that you have a book available too, correct? Yes, I do. I have a book of shamanic poems called uh, In Wild Violet Shrine. And um, these poems, um, well, uh, I've been writing poems for about 30 years. And um, in this particular book of poems, I was directed by spirit to go to another, a deeper level of self-exposure. Uh, you often write about politi- uh, political themes and um, 
Um, but uh, I was directed to go a little deeper uh, into my own personal stories and my own personal poems and my own personal uh, journey of healing, um, uh, my personal journey, the journey of my family, uh, and the journey of um, my people. So um, it was quite a challenge for me and a, a really a beautiful um, experience because spirit, I found spirit uh, working so closely with me when I became afraid and of a certain level of exposure, self-exposure. Uh, it was always spirit that was saying, you are doing this so that other people can heal, so that um, you're sharing this repository of personal injury and personal uh, of bliss, so you're, you're my bliss and my broken you know, um, as a balm of healing so that many, you're making healing possible for many. And and showing people that, you know, you can go into these places of personal injury and you can survive and you can make it beautiful and you can chant these poems and get the ear of the divine and you can, you know, make it a, a less scary place, um, this this fear that we live in as a culture, these, um, um, these um, you know, um, places Places that are not as um, you know or widely accepted in, within ourselves that we feel are, but you know everybody. So many people are in pain and suffering, and so many people come from pain and suffering. So to tell your story is to help others tell theirs. Mm. Now you perform uh, what you call sacred poetry concerts as well, correct? Yes, yes. And I've seen a little taste of your performance, and I have to say that when we were uh, we had our group down uh, at your fabulous Stone Feather Retreat for the Spring Equinox, and we invited you to, to do a performance of one of your poetry works, and it was so touching and so amazingly uh, transformational for everybody. Everybody really enjoyed it. So you are a living, breathing act of beauty yourself, I have to say. Hey, dear. <laughs> Thank you. Now, you also teach uh, emotional freedom technique, uh, correct? And you go through, you, you work with hospice workers and visiting nurse services in New York? I certainly do, yes. Um, EFT was, um, is, is de- very dear to my heart because uh, it was one of the first healing modalities that I tried on, um, that uh, I tried on myself and worked so deeply, quickly, uh, and, and gave me such permanent results. I was in a lot of pain when I discovered EFT, and um, it, they're using this uh, incredible technique. It's a, it's a form of emotional acupuncture without the discomfort of needles. It's a, a very simple tapping procedure that gently realigns the body's energy system. So um, it's uh, it's uh, it's simple. It's a simple technique. It's doable. People can do it on themselves for you know the basic kind of things. But for the more complex issues, of course, I would recommend working with an EFT practitioner. I, I teach this technique to student nurses, uh, student visiting nurses and hospice workers because um, nurses can, you know, um, encounter people in their in their profession every day who are in a, a great deal of pain, and of course hospice workers as well. So um, it's, it, it really delights me to teach this technique that can get a person out of pain without drugs, without surgery. Oftentimes, oftentimes, uh, I, I never, um, you know, recommend that people stop any kind of medical treatment that they're getting. Certainly, but. Uh, EFT works in alignment with whatever kind of medical treatment one is getting. Um, and yeah. it brings about quick results. Yeah, there's a lot of people who want more information on EFT can certainly do a Google search. The Internet is a fabulous resource for finding out more information exactly about what that's all about. Um, I'm, I'm, I've noticed your events coming up have a lot to do with this processes of self-healing, you know, working yeah. in alliance with nature, um, you know, using art and journeying to, to self-heal. Um, one of the things that um, I notice when it comes to these things is that people, you know, we were talking about this earlier about how we, you know, very rarely go within for answers. We're always looking outside of ourselves for answers. When we're experiencing tough times, the shamanic journey itself, inside and, and working with your guides, 
creates a, a sacred space of sorts that allows you to really start to get your own answers. Do you find that most people um, who come to you or who, who you, inter- you know, encounter throughout your, your experience have a tendency to reach outside of themselves, always looking for somebody else to give them an answer? And how do you see that as a shamanic? Uh, how would you approach that shamanically? Yeah, well, that's the culture that we live in. We were trained from a very early age that we don't have power. We, you know, if we're sick, we go to a doctor. Um, so um, I say, you know, every most people who come to me for healing uh, have that um, have that orientation. Um, and many people have, as I said, have read about shamanism, um, and uh, they find me on um, Sandra Ingerman, my teacher's website, um, shamanic teachers, shamanic practitioners uh, dot com, and um, so they they some of them already have an understanding of how the shamanic journey works, and um, you know what is soul retrieval, and um, many of them, I, many people when they find out about it uh, and they get to the point where they call a shamanic practitioner to work with them, I find that they have a, um, they have an inner thirst that they just want to experience this work. It's like a thirst in them. Um, so um, I don't really have to um, lay a lot of the foundation because I find many people already are familiar with it once they get to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then so working with guides, why is that so important? Mm. <laughs> it's, oh boy, um, you know that, that aspect of the shamanic, um, uh, of the shamanic uh, path is really very dear to my heart because um, for so long I've been on a spiritual path for over thirty years, and um, I um, it's always been just me, you know, when I meditate, when I sit down, it's just me and the Creator, and it's a lonely universe. <laughs> So on the shamanic path, um, when I heard that there were um, there were um, loving and kind and compassionate spirit beings in the universe that want to help me resolve my everyday problems, um, I was just astounded to encounter them and to ha- and to have them um, to set up alliances with them so that we could work together. And this this idea of having power animals is in indigenous ancient idea that humans uh, have alliances with an- the animal world and animals want to work with us and give us their medicine and we have medicine for them. Um, it was just, um, it just opened my heart in a beautiful way. Um, and it made me feel that I, I, it makes me feel I'm not alone. Um, I often reflect on the beautiful quote uh, from one of the uh, 13 indigenous grandmothers who says that, um, uh, it's grandmother Rita. And she says that our healing is not just for ourselves, it's for the entire universe. So if this is so, then it it makes perfect sense that there are beings, spirit beings in the entire universe who want to help us to heal so that the universe can heal. And when somebody asks the question, what do you think about darkness and the dark beings? And uh, are they there? Do they interfere with our healing processes? How do you deal with that shamanically? (laughs) Yeah, I will. Sure, they're there. But, um, you know, you walk outside your door and there are nice people and there are, you know, people you don't want to associate with. So you just, um, you know, you, I say uh, get yourself protected, find ways to protect yourself, and stay, stay in the light. Acknowledge the, acknowledge the shadow, because the shadow is always there. The shadow is what is holding up the light. The light is what is holding up the shadow, is that yin and yang. Um, but you know, it's not the, um, it's only fear. It's when, 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 we, when we abide in fear, uh, then we attract the darkness. Uh, if we abide in love and light, then we attract the light. Um, but don't be naive to think that, you know, there is no darkness, <laughs> because there is. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 this is the, the world that we live in, the world of duality. When somebody comes across that in their life, 
and they look at it as something that you know they're that they're being attacked like you know is it possible that these beings can attack you if you if you're doing all of this work and you're in the light how does that work i get asked that question a lot and i'm always curious and i I would love your perspective on that oh you know every so many people these days are concerned about being attacked you know psychic attacks so um, many people feel that they are under attack um and you know (sighs) When I look at television and look at the news, which is something I rarely do, I, then, I, then I feel I'm under attack with the kind of um, the ways that um, uh, the, the news is given to us and the kind of news that is given to us. It just really feeds and fuels uh, our fear. So uh, I say, yes, uh, we are under attack, and be aware uh, when you look at the news that you are being under attack, and um, um, just protect yourself. I, I, I'm really big on protection, uh, spiritual protection, and um, learn some techniques of spiritual protection, and go out and do your work, um, of, you know, of healing and spreading the light. And how would somebody protect themselves? Give us an example of what somebody could do if they felt they were experiencing this. I I also want to comment, too. That's my question, but I want to comment, too. I think that because we're exposed on a a regular basis on all of this thoughts of attack and terrorism and fear and all of these things, that I think that it really creates an interesting um, spiraling kind of energy that we can get caught in very, very quickly quickly and very easily without really noticing what what's happening and so that can be kind of transferred through our psyche as you know a, a common everyday kind of experience don't you think yeah. oh yeah that that and and the attack uh, that coming from us uh, from the inside is something that I find very fascinating uh, these days. I was walking a couple of days ago in midtown Manhattan and uh, on the east side, and I was walking for maybe 20 blocks. And I just uh, often, when I walk in the streets of Manhattan, I kind of put up my protection and just kind of hold my breath and get to where I'm going. But this time I decided just to open my ears to the conversations of around me. And I tell you, Hillary, there was so much uh, violent, uh, violence in people's speech. There was so much emotional energy. I mean, I looked around and people were on their cell phones walking down the street crying and shouting and shouting at people about what they did to them and how they, uh, what happened at their job and what their mother said to them. And their, I mean, in every block, I encountered this kind of negative, uh, uh, to- these, uh, what I call toxins. Uh, they are uh, really um, the toxicity of our thoughts and our words. And I just asked myself, where is all, of it? Where is all this toxicity, toxicity going? Where is, it? is it going up in the universe? Is it going into the earth? Is it, how, how is it uh, affecting us mentally, spiritually, physically? So um, this this idea of um, you know we are being attacked from the inside is the thing is the thoughts that we subject ourselves to that is also a part of the attack and we we have to start being aware of those and changing our thoughts learning uh, ways to change our thoughts and uh, transmute our thoughts. Um, where do you think that with... where do you think that energy goes? Oh gosh. The idea of it, the thought of it. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I can't tell you. I, say, I can't say that I know, but I can say that uh, what I feel about it is that, you know, it's going, it's going, um, it's, it's lodging inside our bodies, inside our cells. It's creating illness. It's creating mental illness. Um, it's going, uh, I would imagine it's going in, you know, it's, it's just um, kind of ricocheting in our environment. Uh, I imagine it's going out in the universe. It's being absorbed by the earth. 
Yeah. Uh, some people know? suggest some people suggest that it goes into you know what creates the earth changes. I don't know if I I don't know if I agree with that 100%, but I'm open to the idea that it certainly yeah. affects it. Um I I don't think that it's the only thing affecting it, but I do agree that the earth is shaking cuz we're shaking on the inside. Yeah. And the the volcanoes and earthquakes are happening because of so much shifting and it's not necessarily just a dark thing. I think it's also a reflection of the light that's changing and shifting, the thoughts that are changing and shifting. So I just think we're so in a process of change and shift, whichever direction you're going, that we're shaking inside whether we're healing and going through you know, the healing process or we're cowering in fear in the corner because we're afraid to look at things. Uh, we're shaking. You know, I certainly agree. Process. Yeah, you know. definitely. Yeah. So how now so let's go back to my my question. So if somebody listening says, "Well, wait a minute, how do I protect myself?" What well, give us an example of a, a something one of our, you know, people can do to protect themselves psychically? Well, you know, because I do the shamanic work and um I get direct um uh access to um the, the um the, guidance um, for myself and for my clients. I always do a, a shamanic journey for a person to see um, how they can, it's, it's individual medicine, so one um, one uh, the way one person would protect themselves psychically would be different than the way another person might protect themselves so I always, I value that part of the shamanic work is that um, it's, it's individual medicine for individual people, so one person might um, the one person's uh, helping spirits might say, you know, um, come when you when you enter your home, wash your hands in a bowl of salt, uh, salted water. Some people might say, you know, some people's uh, helping spirits and power animals might say, you know, wear a crystal, um, have a beautiful pouch with a crystal, and wear it over your heart when you, um, you know, do your work or when you go out when you go to work, protect yourself in that way. So it's it's different for it. For each person, I like that. I like that. No, I really do. I I I agree, a hundred percent. I think that's really, really important because so many people read a book or take a workshop, and it's it's kind of like this one way, one one package kind of deal, and and it should work for everybody. And I see that it doesn't. A lot of people don't, you know, don't. I don't get it. I don't. People. Some people visualize differently. Some people have a harder time seeing things or imagining colors or, or things, and other people can go right in and have these extraordinary inner journeys and they can see absolutely every detail so I, I think that's beautiful and I, I agree and I think that's so important thank you for mentioning that um, so now I want to talk a little bit about your your wonderful stone feather retreat um, yeah. because I know that you and your husband are working very hard to get this place together um, and make it available to groups and to people who are looking for a place to come not only for groups but also I believe you do individual retreats yeah. and stuff so t- let's take a moment for you to talk a little bit about how you started that, what your vision was with it, and how people can participate. Yes, okay. Uh, we bought Stone Feather about seven years ago. Uh, my husband and I live in the city, and uh, in New York City, and uh, we were just kind of weary. We, we love the city. We love access to all the cultural and artistic things here, uh, but we were a little weary of the noise and, the, um, you know, the, the other things that plague city life. So we bought Stone Feather as a retreat for ourselves and our families. Um, and then the vision grew. The more we walked the land and, and uh, experienced the, the peace, the level of peace uh, there, uh, we, we, we really decided it wasn't just for us. It's, it's really for anybody we encounter who needs the, uh, um, the, um, to rejuvenate themselves in nature. So uh, then we started inviting um, you know, our friends and uh, up to Stone Feather just to rejuvenate themselves. And then we started saying, well, maybe we can just have a little, you know, open it as a kind of healing center uh, for people and do classes here. So I began to do the, um, um, the, the work that I do in the city, the uh, shamanic work and the um, uh, shamanic consultations, uh, soul retrieval, div- divination journeys. 
uh, there for uh, people individually, private sessions and the EFT work. And then I began to grow, teach group uh, EFT uh, sessions. Um, and it kind of grew from there. Now um, the, um, small groups are coming up to do uh, healing work, meditation groups, book clubs. Um, it's really we just we just wanted to create a space um, working in alliance with nature. We have some wooded areas. We have some uh, you know pond. We created a, a Japanese a rock garden. We just wanted to create different environments for people to come and be gravitate to whatever their spirit was calling out that that they needed in order to rejuvenate themselves. So um, uh, we created Stone Feather with a lot of love and a lot of creativity. Uh, my husband uh, is a master carpenter. One of the uh, one of the many one of his many gifts. He's also a filmmaker, and um, he uh, he did a lot of work himself. Uh, you know, with his own two hands. And uh, it was a um, when they first bought the uh, house it was a real fixer upper. And uh, he and I, I did the decorating and shows the colors. It's really it's really an act of love from my husband and and myself. And uh, we, uh, there were beautiful spirits on the land who um, delight in greeting uh, people who come to the land uh, to work, do healing work, do ceremonial work, do ritual work. Um, that uh, just uh, continues to expand the light and the radiance of the land. And uh, hopefully we're transforming the, uh, the, the whole environment and for miles around. Well, I, I have to agree that you are definitely doing that. Now, what's your website where people can find out more information yeah, about um, uh, how to reach you if they'd like to come? Great. Um, my website is uh, called healinghistory.googlepages.com. And um, there is, uh, you can click on retreat and find out all about Stone Feather. Uh, you can also click on um, shamanic classes. Uh, over this, this summer, I'm doing a, a whole series of shamanic classes, uh, weekend retreats, twice a month uh, from June until uh, the end of October. So if you're interested at all in learning about the path of shamanism, different forms of shamanic healing, both basic shamanic journeying and more advanced shamanic healing techniques, um, I'm also teaching medicine for the earth. My teacher, Sandra Ingerman's work. I'm also teaching healing with uh, spiritual light classes. Um, so there are weekend retreats all day Saturday, spend the night. Um, there's camping if people are interested in camping out under the stars and um, sleeping with nature. Um, there's also indoor accommodations, of course. So we have all day Saturday, all day Sunday workshops in shamanic healing. So go to the website and you'll find out um, some of how, you know how to purchase my book and Wild Violet Shrine uh, and some of the other healing work that I'm doing. Well, we have about, I don't know, 15 minutes or so left of the show. So I'm wondering if we could go ahead and do one of your poems now, um, and then we can kind of talk a little bit more after and give people some more information. Um, for those of you who are just checking in, I'm speaking to Stephanie Elston Nero, and she's a shamanic healer, and we've had a wonderful conversation about the dark and the light and the power of words and creating sacred space. And uh, you can always go back and listen to the show itself in my archives. It will be posted on my radio archive page on AchieveRadio.com for anybody to download as an mp3 file listen on the go um but i really think that your words stephanie have been very very important um being on the radio that the power of words that go out and ripple through the world through you know each person's individual psyche you know kind of, it can it's kind of like a, a domino effect and yeah. uh, i love how you choose your words very carefully and how you pronounce certain words a little bit more with a little more oomph that really give people almost a healing in just listening to you. So I yeah. really believe that listening to you recite your poetry is a powerful healing process in itself and I would be honored if you could do that for us now and then we could talk a little bit about it after. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do a poem now. Um, this poem... Um 
what led me to the, the spiritual, the shamanic path, people ask me what, uh, you know, how, how I um, got involved in shamanism. I think from my birth, um, I was led to the shamanic path. I was uh, born and raised in North Philadelphia, a very poor section of Philadelphia. And um, I, uh, from a very, uh, um, ever since I was a small child, there's something inside my spirit that um, would look around me and see my family and my community experience, experiencing such poverty, such need, such lack. And I always felt that I wanted to heal them of this poverty, to heal them. And so I took on the role of healer in my family. And... Um, um, I think this role is imprinted in my spirit. So this um, this upbringing, uh, these childhood circumstances and poverty, I think, have reflected in this poem I'm, I'm going to read now. And I didn't know what I was, when I first created this poem, I didn't know it was about um, um, my spirit's response to growing up in poverty, always feeling that I don't come from poverty. There's something in my spirit that knows it comes from someplace else this other world always upon me. So um, this is the poem. I turn to the east and see a gorgeous pain has changed in me. I turn to the west and see a gorgeous pain has changed in me. To the north and the south above below me I see, I see. A gorgeous pain has changed in me Into flesh, into flesh I fell Into flesh I fell from something somewhere into form in North Philadelphia With no special gifts except to breathe beyond the place I stood To breathe beyond the place I stood I turn to the north and see a gorgeous pain has changed in me. The bells inside my spirit ever tolling to another time. The wind inside my soul moving through another place. The bones of another earth beneath my skin, inside my skin. This other world always upon me. I grew wings. I fled my body. No visible wounds except scars of lightning beneath my skin just before storm. When the air is wet with wooded places, thunder in the roots of trees, I travel in the sky beneath my skin to forgotten places inside my bones. I sing in the mouth of storm, in the wind of another world, this other world always moving through me, Always upon me, the bells inside my soul, ever tolling to another time. The wind inside my spirit, moving through another place. The bells inside my bones, ringing, ringing, ringing to another time. Listening to Stephanie Elston Nero, educator, poet, and beautiful woman. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. That was that was really just so fabulous. And I just I just have to say once again how honored I really am to have you here and to share this space with me and my listeners. And the healing that you bring through your work is evident in not only your beautiful spirit, but the sound that comes out of your mouth every time you speak. Thank so you. I have to say that very, very, very powerful. What is well, your? I, I want to say to you something that we used to say in North Philadelphia: "It takes one to know one." <laughs> so <laughs> well. all the things that you say about me are mirror reflections of the things that I feel about you and your work and your commitment to this healing work and shamanic work. Well, thank you. That really means a lot. It, what, yeah. what is your message for people who listen to your work? What is your hope and your intent that they get from 
from how you express yourself artistically and shamanically? What, what is your message for the world? For those listening, you know, I usually ask this in the last few minutes of the show. We have about 10 minutes, so take your time and really go into it and, and share with everybody listening what it is that your vision is for the world. Thank you. My vision for the world. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is um, this beautiful Tibetan Buddhist prayer that I have taken on as my prayer for myself and my family and my community and my all the people of the earth and our mother, our great, great mother, this planet Earth. Um, the prayer is, uh, may all forms of misery be forever ending. May all forms of misery be forever ending. May all forms of misery be forever ending. So, you know, that prayer is my vision. Um, there are so many people in so much pain. Um, there are so many, um, uh, I, I, because of my background coming from a very poor community in North Philadelphia, urban community, I, um, I delight in the uh, idea of having a practice in Harlem and um, extending my services to the community, sharing, spreading this shamanic wisdom. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have health care. Uh, you don't need health care to practice and get healing shamanically. Um, it doesn't matter if you have, you know, uh, lots of money to visit the doctor. Some people don't have, you know, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, the kinds of crazy money that doctors are asking these days. Uh, although I always recommend if people are have very serious, you know, emotional, physical ailments that they see a medical doctor certainly um, but uh, working shamanically in alliance with the medicine medical field um, brings great um, great great results to people um, I see people here in Harlem from um, many many walks of life many people from the community many people um, that you know can't afford to pay can't afford to pay to go study in Santa Fe or California or Africa or Brazil um, you know these healing techniques these shamanic healing techniques Techniques. So, um, uh, I delight in sharing um, the shamanism with um, people of many multi, uh, multi, you know, ethnic uh, people, urban dwellers who come and get healing and uh, have access now have access to the loving, kind, and compassionate beings of the universe to that they can plug into, that they can call up and say, "Hey, I have this problem. I need some." Guidance. I need some help, and the help comes. So, um, the, the what I my vision is that people um, people realize for themselves that they are enough, that they are a reflection of the divine, and there is help at every turn. Um, there is no need for hopelessness and fear. Uh, there is no need for poverty. Um, there is help at every turn. You just have to know how to summon it from the universe. Our healing is not just for ourselves. It's for the entire universe. Know that your healing is yours. You are worthy of it. You're deserving of it. doesn't matter if you don't have money to pay, to pay for it. <laughs> it's true. A lot of people struggle with that aspect of it. They look at it as something that isn't, you know... Um, it's an extra. It's something that, you know, well, when I have enough money, I wrote a whole book about this very topic because it was so important for people to understand their relationship with money and how, you know, how it how it is really reflected yeah. in the world around them um, and I think you brought up an important topic that we can cover for the last few minutes of the show because you know when somebody says well I don't have enough for this or that they really may not have enough yeah. for that so how do they change that shamanically how do they look at that concept of, of you know I don't know some people call it poverty consciousness uh, you know what would yeah. you say to somebody 
Yes. Well, I recently did a workshop this past Saturday in Brooklyn, and uh, I always I always journey uh, in advance of the workshops. Um, I was doing a series of Brooklyn workshops on uh, once a month uh, from November of last year to uh, uh, just uh, this past Saturday, and. Um, I always journey in advance, and I ask the spirits, "What should we, what what should we work on uh, in this upcoming uh, workshop, and and what are and what would be appropriate for the people who are going to be gathered, even though we don't know exactly who's going to be there, but the spirits know." So um, they gave me some information about manifesting um, that I was not aware of. And I've been working on, you know, different manifesting projects for a long time now. But they gave me another key that I I shared with the group and we did some journeying on. And that was um, the aspect of, you know, you, 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 you do, you know, everything, you know, they're saying you do. You sit down, you visualize, you, you dream, you, you um, make it vivid for you, you act as if you already have have it, but there's another link, and that is a um, our our ancestral link. Sometimes um, there is a block in our ancestral line to our abundance, so we journey to our ancestors to find out if there were any such blocks in our ancestral line um, to approach um, our finances. And there was some very fascinating um, uh, findings, reflections, and guidance from the ancestors. So oftentimes, the living, we get very um, um, self, um, as we think, you know, the living, we as living people are the, only, are the only ones that matter, that there are no other worlds, that there are no ancestral worlds, that the ancestors are not waiting to guide us and look, you know, help us. Um, and... Um, um, but when we ask the ancestors, they always, they are always there. They are always with us. They always want to help us. And uh, in my work with Maladoma Patrice Somme, uh, an incredible elder shaman of the Dagra people in Burkina Faso, he's been living in this country for uh, over 30 years, and he's written uh, incredible books called of, of Water in the Spirit and um, The Healing uh, Wisdom, of, uh, Wisdom of Africa. His his whole culture is a uh, is an ancestral culture. They, he he always says, um, you know, by healing the ancestors, we heal ourselves. So that aspect of healing the ancestors of um, any blocks to their creativity that we have inherited by working with the ancestors, by healing the ancestors, we heal ourselves as well. I'm just letting your words soak in. <laughs> I'm listening to you speak. And I, I you know, I, I had no formal preconceived questions for you because I knew that this conversation was going to be wonderfully organic and we would just kind of go with the flow of it and see where we were meant to go into things. And uh, for for those of people who listen to my show regularly, I've done several shows with Barbara Han Clow where we talk about the collective consciousness and healing, healing our connection to our true history and how when that connection to our true history is, you know, there's block or there's healing that needs to be done or there's there's bad recall or we don't really know where we come from. There There's a big wound there. And I want to touch on this in the last couple minutes of the show because one of the things that you really take the time out to do in your work is something called healing history. And that you just touched on really with your with the last few minutes of what you were talking about is how we heal the ancestors and how we're really contributing to our own healing process because we really don't know who we are unless we know where we come from you know even if it's as a culture even if it's you know if you're adopted and you don't know your biological you know story but you might know your cultural story so your ancestors connect all the way back to the beginning um how important that is, especially now as we move through many changes and we're going through forward and beyond and, you know, any, any step that we take in our life today forward, you know, we're carrying that with us, don't you think? Oh, definitely. Um, this workshop that I do called Healing History, Transmuting, Transforming, Transcending the Wounds of Racism, Slavery, and Oppression, 
um, that work came out of um, working, uh, walking in the woods. Um, while walking in the woods, I encountered um, um, some and uh, the spirits of some enslaved runaways, enslaved uh, ancestors, and um, uh, through doing some shamanic work with uh, those spirits, uh, this workshop came out and and uh, came through. And um, I, I facilitate as a facilitator of this healing history workshop. It's to help us. It's to help us remember um, what happened on this land and the, the toxic residue that slavery has left here and racism has left here and oppression of women has left here. Uh, it is to help us work uh, with art, with the sacred uh, space that is our imagination, with the, the healing capacity of art and writing. Uh, it is to um, help us remember healing rituals and shamanic practices to help um, remove the residue, the environmental residue and the residue in our bodies and cells of slavery, racism, and oppression. It's also uh, um, designed to help us connect with our ancestral spirits to see how to ask them how they want to be healed. Mm, how do we you are want asking. to be healed? Incredible, incredible power in that. We are out of time. Stephanie yeah. Nero, everybody, I want to say thank you for joining me. Her link is on my website and radio homepage if you'd like more information. Until next time, everyone, namaste. Namaste.